Just as digital forensics constantly adapts and evolves, so must the training that goes with it. This week, Krista and Sai with the Forensic Focus podcast welcome James Eichbaum, Global Training Manager at MSAB. Welcome, James. Ah, nice to be here. It's been, uh, it's been, I think, two years since we last spoke with you, and that was a written interview rather than a podcast. So, uh, so what's new? Oh, my. Yeah. <laughs> COVID. That's what was new. Yeah. Uh, so it's, yeah. Been a, yeah. it's been a while. Uh, um, hmm. But yeah, that's, that's kind of changed a lot mm-hmm. in uh, training anyway. Okay. Uh, and, and how we do some deliveries. I think we'll talk about that. And, um, but yeah, but now, now we're finally back at it, uh, getting into the classroom, which yep. is good. Yep. Uh, it's a lot of fun in my in my staff. Uh, I mean, they've been itching to get back out there and get on airplanes and hotels. So I'm yeah. sure, yeah, because I mean, it, it's it's you um, the um, uh, the feedback from the audience just isn't the same virtually, is it? Nah, it's just uh, no, it's not. I mean, we we do get good feedback nevertheless, but uh, nothing beats being in the classroom and right. having hands on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how about what's the same with MSAB training? Well, well, the same with our training, we still have our certification courses yep. and we, we are doing some changes that are coming down the line um, soon, hopefully. Uh, we're working on some uh, changes to our course material okay. uh, to make it even better. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, the, the training is constantly evolving. Uh, it, it's not staying the same. You know, even uh, as we go, our courses, we always have like the uh, the foundations built into them of forensics in general, mm-hmm. best practices. And we try to keep you know up to date with that and make sure our students are doing the best they can and doing the right things, not only just using our tools, but in the practice of digital forensics, mm-hmm. doing it properly. Mm-hmm. 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 So, I mean, that changes, you know, as we go through time and uh, and our tools, you know, our tools are constantly evolving. So. Uh, that's been changing too. Adding new features and keeping our our material up to date—that's a constant task mm-hmm. that our guys have to work with. Um, yeah, so a lot of work, a lot of things happening with the training department. I think you're um, you're getting a little bit into uh, my next question here, and I'm hoping you'll go into a little more detail. Um, so you've been at this a really, really long time, and the market has matured in many ways. Um, what are the main technical or procedural challenges? that you're seeing customers bring to classes that I think it sounds like are, are factoring into uh, the, the changes that you're talking about with training. Yeah, well, I think it's, um, I mean, one of the big questions in training all the time is, you, know, you can you get into this device? Can you get into that phone? And, mm-hmm. and that's one of the big challenges we see our customers facing and they bring those questions to the classroom. Um, and it's not just the devices, it's the apps that they're seeing on the phones as well. Um, you know, some apps, you know, they're popular for a while, then one's going to pop up out of nowhere and take over and be the next thing. So it's all about, you know, we, we have the training, but we also have this R&D that just has to keep happening behind the scenes. Um, f- reverse engineering and figuring out ways to get into these, these devices that are locked. Mm-hmm. That's the big challenge. Um, devices that are encrypted, big challenge. Um, and then the same thing with the apps. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's one of the things we have to tackle mm-hmm. challenges um, and we're working on and our and our R&D guys are doing a great job. Um, the other thing, too, is our customers, you know, they they are in demand of being able to do their job faster and more efficient all the time. You know, as we see throughout the years, you know, things yeah. have just gotten bigger, devices, storage, time that it takes to extract data, um, laws change over the years, case law comes about, and we mm-hmm. have to, uh, you know, we have to answer those, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we uh, answer to what's happening? Mm-hmm. And um, so we come about with new challenge, new, new ways of tackling these challenges with like targeted extractions, um, helping our customers, okay, this is what you need. Let's just get straight to it, get that data off the phone and start working with it. Um, that's faster. They can get the data and narrow the, narrow the search a bit so they can get uh, to the evidence they're looking for much faster. Um, you know, trying to find ways to identify the data. You know, our, our examine tool is pretty powerful. I think it's the best tool on the market. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, we have these powerful filtering capabilities built in there uh, to help people uh, narrow down uh, the data to get to what they're looking for quicker. We have the uh, content recognition 
engine. Uh, it's amazing to help them find data. Um, so we're always innovating to try to find new ways to help our customer. Steganography, that's a, a, a new feature coming out. Yeah. Where we're looking for and identifying uh, media within media. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, that's a, another cool cool feature. And there's always little things too. We in the training department don't even know about sometimes. They kind of sneak through and we don't even see it on the uh, release notes that come out when it's a surprise. <laughs> and then somebody discovers it and we're like, oh my God, we do that. That's cool. <laughs> So, so, sorry, my, my, can I jump in? But I, I know you've got your your, your questions. But you do, you, you yeah. said you talked you talked about sort of um, the the legislative changes and, and and things like that. And obviously, we're seeing that um, with with privacy laws being implemented in various countries. But you're based in Sweden yourself. Uh, mm, yeah. MSAB is a is an American company. If I'm, uh, it's a Swedish company. It's a Swedish oh. company as well. So ha, your your focus is that around European law, or is it around, uh, or are you, you trying to be as global we, as possible? Exactly, we try to be as global as possible. I mean, we have you know a huge presence in Europe. Yes, we have a huge presence in in North America, and other countries around the world. Um, and uh, you know, we just get feedback from customers. Um, the larger they shout, the better, the easier it is for us to react. Uh, react you know this squeaky wheel is the one that always gets the grease so if we if we hear something that's happening oh you guys have to have this in the product it's necessary definitely we're going to be trying to implement that for them um, because we want them doing the job the best job they can and get that evidence presented in court without issue Um, whether it's you know uh, we're only allowed to look at a certain time frame okay then we want to be able to target that time frame for the extraction. We only can look at this particular data. Okay, we wanna be able to target that data for you and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, And and then we have all kinds of other features built into the tool to help us um, get customers, get the data and only the data that they're allowed to see or at least filter down the data where then they can pass it off to somebody else for them to take a look at. So I guess that was, sorry, sorry, we keep talking to each other. It's all right. Uh, this this goes to a comment I made earlier about getting three recording streams. Um, so, um, yeah, no, we've had some interesting conversations with uh, with with guys in forensics talking about um, a very targeted collection of data, um, and that seems definitely to be the way that things are going. How just just to, you know, with regards to to that, um, one of my concerns is a, a I do a lot of defense work. One of my concerns is that we're potentially missing out on collecting. Uh, valuable data that could be an, uh, of an exculpatory nature. How 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 do we sort of address that with with your products with training to to make sure that we're not being too blinkered in our approach um, when when we're being uh, doing our collections? Um, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, that's one of the things we do teach in training, and and training is essential. They have to go to training so they can understand this that there is that exculpatory evidence that. You know, you should also be looking to potentially find, you know, because you don't want to ignore it and then have the defense find it and then show how biased you were in your in your analysis, because we're just supposed to be fact finders. So, uh, yeah, we can narrow this down and you're supposed to take from a specific time frame. Um, but there, you know, obviously, who can change the uh, timestamp or the, their, their phone's uh, date time? settings of course and then get around that and then you, you potentially miss that because they've purposely tried to keep evidence from you you know or try to hide it or try to hide their tracks uh, so yeah we have that option we can broaden that and then sh- display that or you can use our time filter and exclude that so yeah those are options and those are always uh um i say uh, things that you could trip over in your investigation, but people, you know, going through doing this job in this field have to be aware that that is a possibility. You can't just take a timestamp as a uh, uh, gospel and say, oh, that's absolutely correct. When no, we know things can be altered by suspects who are trying to do nefarious things. Um, but then we could also um, take into effect, okay, wh- what could have happened here? to make this timestamp outside of our, our field of, of what we're looking for. Um, could it have been something else? Or, or like you say, could it be something that um, is totally um, innocent in nature and uh, it, it can show that the, the defendant actually did not do what we're saying he did. But um, 
you know, being able to identify these things, uh, uh, you know, using the tools properly, but also using some investigative knowledge and common sense, and then also some experience behind it is going to help them realize or see these things and, um, and be able to articulate this, of course, in court or articulate it when they're going to the warrant and say, okay, I know you may want to be restrictive in this, but in this situation, uh, we may need to look outside this area because these things can happen and don't just lock me into, oh no, uh, I can only look at this when I know in my own experience that this could happen. You know, got to try to fight. Mm-hmm. How do you counsel um, trainees, though? I mean, like I'm thinking about the practicalities of this when I mean, um, I think a, a big subject of discussion is backlog. Um, you know, when you've got the, the supervisor or the manager or the commander that doesn't understand the science that is, um, you know, wants to see a, a, a certain case clearance rate or, or backlog court systems. I mean, it, it just doesn't. Um, seem like it necessarily, like the, I, I think it's the, um, the landscape or the environment around the examiner that might not lend itself to um, that kind of meticulousness. So how are you counseling them to kind of deal with those practicalities? Yeah, triaging, trying to get to the uh, data they're looking for to try to make their examination a little quicker. I mean, we, we have those things built into the tool to help them with that. Um, they do have to educate their their supervisors and their supervisors should um, get some at least some overview training themselves mm-hmm. to see what what their what their staff is encountering. I remember my own bosses back in the day, they had no idea what I did. Um, you know, and it's like, oh, I need this, this and that. And uh, unfortunately for me, they were able to just sign off and say, you can buy whatever you want because I don't really understand what you do. Um, but uh, you know, thing, things do change. You get some supervisors, you know, of course, uh, management who are, are not uh, educated in this field uh, and they, they need to be. And maybe the, uh, the examiners need to have them come in and see, you know, how much time this actually takes, how much time an extraction actually takes, you know, how, how long does it take to get the data off this phone? Okay, now I've got the data off the phone. Now I've got to look for the evidence from the, what I just extracted, and that's going to take some time. Um, but then seeing that, okay, these tools that I'm using and, you know, why I need to buy certain pieces of software is so that I can get to filtering and uh, get to the data that I'm looking for quicker so I don't have to spend all this time looking through uh, needless uh, things where I can get those out of view. Um, and, and make my job easier, faster, more efficient, get those cases cleared. You know, I can just relate back to, I mean, I always say it's funny because, you know, I say now, oh, I remember back when, and, and the kids kind of laugh, oh, yeah, but it, it's the same thing with it. I remember way back when in digital forensics in the beginning, you know, um, where, you know, it would, it would take a long time to do uh, a hard drive, and then they got bigger and bigger, and it just took more and more, and Man, um, those those exam times were long, and and it was the joke that if you sent something off to a task force to do it, um, it was the black hole, and you'd be lucky if you saw it again in months, you yeah. know, three or four months. Yeah. Um, and we don't need that. We can't have that happening. We need to have these, uh, you know, these cases solved faster. Um, and uh, there's just the volume is just too great now uh, to send it off someplace. You know, uh, we have to have you know, folks doing this job, doing the analysis, uh, a lot more of them, uh, not just not just the like the old days where I would say that was us propeller head sitting in lab. We did the extraction, we did the analysis, we gave the results when we were done with them. That's not the case these days. You, we may be mm-hmm. doing maybe the extraction, but somebody else has to be doing the analysis. There's just too much mm-hmm. for one person to do it all. Mm-hmm. And uh, we just need whatever help with the tools that we have to make that job easier. An interesting sort of difference between the computer forensics and mobile forensics is this, uh, the device is very much more alive in mobile forensics than it mm-hmm. is in in, um, in in sort of computer forensics, uh, hard disk based forensics anyway. Um, when, when we're sort of, when you're training on this, this sort of triage type process, uh, oh, are we? Are you training them up on the sort of impacts that they're having on the device in the process of creating, um, creating these images and looking for stuff? Because obviously they're interacting with something in a live, uh, a live mm. way, and that 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 seems to me that we need to very much. Uh, it was phrased the other day 
uh, in fact, by somebody we're going to talk about uh, the four mobile projects in a minute. And it was Matthew. And I forgot this. Uh, Sorrel. Sorrel. Yes. Yeah, we yeah. were talking to the other day. Um, and he was saying that, you know, it, it's very much that there's a sort of a layer of dirt that we start to create above a point in a, in a forensic examination of a mobile phone. Um, how are we addressing that in training that, you know, everything before X is good, everything after uh, after X is, is something that we've added to it or have altered in some way? Yeah, I mean, it, we stress the network isolation portion of that where we try to, you know, make sure that the phone can't be interacted with remotely from the user to pr preserve data. But we also, you know, talk, teach them, okay, when you have the phone, how do you properly use it? We don't want to, we want to make as little changes as possible, if any. Um, whether, you know, we're, we're doing an Android extraction and we're forced to push an agent onto the device. All right, well, we've done something. We push something there. Is there a possibility that something could be overwritten? Yeah, it's possible. Um, so we have to educate them that it can happen. Um, during the extraction process, uh, and as we work with the phone, we have a log that's generated that keeps track of everything that the tool has done in this case. Um, so we can always go back and say, okay, yeah, this was written to the device at this date and time. Uh, and then we can, the, the examiner should be able to explain what that's doing because they went to the training to learn this is why this has to happen in order to get the data from the phone to talk to it. Um, but yeah, it, it is stressed during the training courses that, uh, yeah, it's a live device. The clock is always ticking. Um, you do an extraction of a phone one day, you do it the next day, you're not going to have a hash value that matches between the two like you would have and expect in the old fashioned uh, computer forensic days with the hard disks. Um, and so you just have to be able to, uh, number one, document everything you do uh, and, and ensure everything you do is repeatable so that uh, the defense, you know, they can go through the same process and come to the same conclusion. Um, and that if something happens and goes crazy screwy, you know, you just have to document it and be truthful about it. Uh, I always give an example in my classes. If I teach, you know, I, there's a really good example of uh, a search warrant that was conducted with one, my old agency. I wasn't there, um, but other detectives were seizing evidence at the time and and they decided to look for it themselves and they didn't have any training in this field and the next thing i know i pull this uh, piece of evidence out of uh, uh, out of the evidence room i extract it and i find two deleted videos on there a video that was taken during the search warrant and uh, i'm okay uh, they realized what they did they tried to delete it and and I had to tell them, hey, if something happens, you know, this is a device you're working with, just document it, record it, and we can work with it. Don't hide it. Don't try to cover it up because then everything you've done is in question. Mm -hmm. I'm up. Uh, I'm... That... <laughs> I can say we, we, we all have, have, uh, have, have a version of that one. I mean, uh, uh, my, my, my similar story was just that... Um the police officer had managed to pick it up it was it was during a, um, a harassment case in the uk um and in the process of examining the phone actually managed to dial the person who was being harassed by the <laughs> the owner of the phone um which obviously went down like a lead balloon with the court so um mm -hmm. so yeah so it's a, it's definitely a real issue that first responders need to be uh, educated and um so do you in your courses do, are there various levels that you're providing so a, a sort of a first responder one for uh, a more a shorter, more blunt course before you get mm. to an examiner? Well, that and the supervisors as well, because you were talking about that a little bit um, um, earlier, where it's it's really the same problem with supervisors that we were seeing 20, 25 years ago, where they didn't understand what mm. people were doing. So, yeah, I, I mean, and we do have, and I know you wanted to talk about frontline, mm -hmm. but frontline being those first responders are the ones that are first taking the phone. Um, whenever, and I don't know if I'm going to jump ahead or anything, about what you want to talk about, but with the frontline solution that we have, our kiosk, our express, our tablet solutions, um, we've already found that it's it doesn't work if you, even though you think this kiosk is simple enough to use, where you just push the buttons and walk through the extraction, and yeah, everything's going to be great. No, that's not the case. You know, you know, if we have we happen to have a, a kiosk drop shift drop shipped um, years ago, and uh, of course the customer opened it up, didn't know what to do. But when we have a sale of a kiosk solution or frontline solution, training goes with it. 
And uh, whether it's, you know, we have a logical training, we have physical training with our frontline solutions. Um, but during that training, not only are they taught how to push the buttons on the screen to advance a workflow that's custom to their organization, but they also get the same basic foundation principles of digital forensics that they would get in a, in a full-blown you know, certification course uh, of using the office product. Uh, so we want everybody to be able to you know, handle evidence uh, properly, uh, maintain that integrity so that, you know, yeah, we got the data and we want you to be able to go to court and testify to this and not have to worry about it the question, being a question you know, and, and potentially thrown out. We don't want that happening. So frontline, anybody that's using our kiosk or frontline solutions, um, they're either going through training from us personally, or we're seeing them go through um, training from those that have been through our train the trainer program. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they've been certified by us to be trainers. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were comfortable with them delivering our training to their, to their users. Fantastic. So what are some specific training challenges um, in that? I mean, across all of these, whether it's train a trainer or um, the different levels of, um, of investigators or examiners that you're training. Um, and you had mentioned COVID, obviously, I think that's been mm -hmm. the big one for everybody. Um, but what are some of the other um, training challenges that, that your team has run into and um, how have those challenges changed over time? Well, I, I do have to, you know, talk about COVID, COVID has changed the way we deliver some things. Um, I mentioned earlier at the beginning that, you know, classroom, being in the classroom is the best because nothing beats being in the classroom. You know, you could say the, the classroom's not scripted. So the only scripted part about it being in a classroom is just the slides, if we have those or the workbook. But other than that, you know, we have, uh, when we have a training course, students are handed multiple phones through the week. You know, our trainers carry 70 phones in a Pelican case when they go deliver a course. So they, they get hands-on and feature phones, Android, smartphones, uh, uh, off-brand chipsets, you know, just to play with in the classroom. There's always going to be that situation in the classroom where things are not going to go the way you want them to go. It always happens. And that's the best learning environment for the student because they can learn how to troubleshoot better that way. Uh, figure out, okay, what happened here? And then we have to walk through it. COVID brought up the, the situation where we couldn't get to the classroom. And we had to find another way to, to deliver our material to the students and get them certified. Um, we had just started uh, working on on-demand training. And we figured, okay, we have one course that's perfect for on-demand training because it's, it's our software examine analysis tool where uh, we can use sample files for that and then go through. Those sample files use the ODT and get certified. Um, but uh, that course had just come out and then COVID hit. So we decided to take our XOY certification course, which has traditionally been classroom only, and move that into an ODT scenario. It took a while to develop, um, but uh, we had it going around May 2020. So not too long after the lockdowns and such, uh, which was great, and that that took off, and that was that was nice. We had a magnificent developer in our in our training staff who put that together, uh, created some s simulations, so it made it look and feel like you were using XOI and you were doing extractions, but you didn't really have a phone in your hand on the other end of the screen. Uh, so that that was a major drawback. Then we uh, found another way to implement training to our customers, and that was with live online. Uh, so yeah, we had the on-demand situation, but people still like to talk to an instructor. So then we uh, worked a way around it where we could have Teams, that's our platform, MSAB. And so we would have a, a Teams meeting run. Our students would join that. And then every student was issued a virtual machine. Um, and so they would log into their virtual machine and then have Teams up and running. And we had um, all the software licensed on the VM that they could access and sample files, plus the simulations that we created for the ODT, and you had the instructor live interaction. Uh, so last year, especially Q1 last year, that was that was it. And we did a lot of days of training with live online, um, and none of our none of our staff traveled. Um, now it's changed. Q1 this year, 
they asked, why do you have so much more spending in your budget this year? Uh, Because we're back on the road Mm -hmm. and uh, buying tickets and and hotels. So now we're back in the classroom. We don't have as much live online training. We still have it. We have a class coming up in just a few weeks. Um, But now we're back in the classroom and that's the way we want to have it. Um, if we're going to be using devices, that is the way, yeah, yeah. the way, the way we want it. Uh, otherwise, um, uh, ODT is great um, for the other options. Um, other challenges, you know, keeping our courses up to date. Uh, I mentioned earlier, things are always changing. Um, our advanced acquisition course, you know, having to revisit that and make that keep that relevant uh, in the time that we're in because. When we first started that advanced acquisition course years ago, you know, it started off with just JTAG. And then we evolved and went into chip off. Uh, and now chip off, you know, with uh, encryption, you know, that's starting to not be as relevant. You know, we're looking at ISP um, uh, and, and trying to get uh, work with that. So we're always looking at new ways to um, introduce new um new ways of doing extractions, new ways of getting to the data into that course. Um, yeah, so just keeping everything up to date and making sure uh, we're yeah. in the classroom, that's the biggest challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you um are you seeing any new audiences come into training? Is it still kind of the same or do you see more like mm-hmm. um, attorneys or corporate investigators or, or um, other, other sort of walks of professionals? Uh, no, I mean with MSAB, we've our target audience has always been you know law enforcement, military, yeah, right. and government, and so we have very little um, space uh, in the market for corporate. Um, so we, uh, I mean, we we did have some big names um, that are customers of ours, but it's there's not many. And so our, 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 our audience is still mainly law enforcement um, and military as the big ones. Um, and as far as attorney, attorneys go, yeah, it would be DA's uh, primary yeah, yeah, target yeah. for that. Um, we, we don't see private um, or um, private uh, attorneys or public mm-hmm. defenders. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sorry, I was going to say, I, I, I've, I've, been relatively familiar with XR or why I've had, I mean, I've never had a license myself. Sadly, I can't afford it. I'm, I'm independent and I'm broke. Um, <laughs> but um, I have come across evidence provided and, and it's it's always turned up with a beautiful uh, viewer that, that comes with it. And that's, mm-hmm. that's, that's been fantastic. And it's something I, I'm, I, I think is a great product. Um, but I've only ever seen mobile phones. Do you, do you branch out beyond mobile phones as a company? Um, Cause obviously there's a huge amount of, uh, well, in in iWatch and Android wearable devices, but also you know tablets and games, doohickeys oh, and televisions yeah, yeah. and all sorts of other yeah, things. Just, that... <laughs> drones. <laughs> think of drones, drones. Yeah. Think of games. I just saw one of our I, I, Martin Westman. You, you guys, you know Martin. I just saw him walk into the office. Uh, it was last week or the week before, carrying a Nintendo Switch. I'm like, hey, what are you doing? You know. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's got two two things. You have a little R and D and a little gaming. So yeah, but uh, definitely we do other other devices besides um, phones. You know, mobile devices. So yeah, um, gaming platforms, tablets for sure. Um, uh, but uh, drones, yes, we had been doing drones, um, and uh, IoT devices. Uh, are in the research and development. So anything that uh, travels with you, we're trying to uh, support as best we can. Um, we, we, you know, there, there, you could do a hard drive with XRY. It's not recommended. I mean, we're not going to decode it for you uh, unless it's, you know, got Android apps and stuff on there. But um, now our focus is uh, mobile devices, um, whether it is wearables or it's iPads or um, tablets or um, yeah, gaming yeah. devices, yeah. keep yeah. an eye out. Cool. I um I have a final question. I can't speak for Sai, but um I want to jump back. I feel like the conversation um it got to a point where it it had multiple branches and we followed one branch and we didn't follow the other, but uh, we, um, uh, I was curious about your role in the For Mobile project, as I mentioned earlier, um, it wrapped this past spring, training was one of its key deliverables. How did MSAB help shape that deliverable? 
Um, I mentioned a little while ago that I had this fantastic uh, curriculum developer within the mind department. Um, he developed our, uh, our ODT material from the beginning. Uh, it was fantastic. Um, I wish, if you want to check it out, I got, I'd love to show you sometime. I, th I think it's amazing. Um, but he was ended up tasked and his full focus was to assist and help with the Four Mobile Project. Okay. His name is Phil Cobley, um, if you know Phil. Um, but uh, he ended up uh, creating the ODT material for Four Mobile okay. um, and being a big part of uh, the Four Mobile's um, uh, curriculum. Of course, the Norwegian Police College, they're the ones that were in charge of Four Mobile. They had that uh, block as their task. Mm -hmm. And so we were one of the um, side you know, factors to help them out. Um, of course, my training team helped out during the process, not with just training, but other other portions of the uh, development of 4Mobile, um, creating a file system uh, manual. Uh, one of my team was uh, one of the essential parts of that, which was great. Uh, but yeah, uh, that was our, our contribution. We also, you know, through our LMS, um, now their, uh, their ODT was hosted on, a, on the same LMS platform we were using. Uh, yeah. Very cool. Okay, so I'll, I'll go with my last question. I mean, you, you, you said earlier um, that, uh, you know, that you're expanding into some interesting areas, like stenog stenography. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let the editors get that one. Stenography. Um, and, and also you said that, uh, you know, sometimes features turn up that you don't know about, which is mm -hmm. it's pretty cool. What features that you do know about that are coming up excite you? What's, 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 um, what's, what's the next the the next release going to bring to us the the or the couple of releases down the line if it's it's truly an R and D but what's what's uh, what's floating your boat at the moment what's lighting the fire that's gonna the, that's gonna bring real interest into the next training session where you're gonna be excited to open it up and go this is the coolest tool that I've seen in in uh, in a while well the steganography part is coming that's gonna be pretty sweet um, I I have to I have to talk about our uh, report building feature uh, in examine now. Um, I can only go back again, back in my day, back a long time ago. Um, when we're doing uh, our examinations, you always, I always had Word document open and I'm sitting there at the same time I'm doing my exam. I'm over here in Word typing along what I'm doing and I have, you know, everybody has their own format and how things are done, their own agencies. And then and if I find something I have to copy and paste it over into Word and make it look pretty. Our report building feature now, uh, in examine, it's fresh, uh, it's amazing, and it's better than things I've used other computer forensic tools in the past that had its own built in reporting features that were kind of, in my opinion, clunky. Um, and uh, yeah, but this is nice drag and drop. Uh, once you've figured out and you can make it mimic what your reporting is to look like for your agency as well, or what you're used to. You can make it look like that. So that's an amazing thing. It's a it's a, a big time saver. Um, uh, the examine tool, uh, the timeline features, the geographic view features that are coming, being updated. Those are going to be amazing as well. Keep a lookout for those. Uh, the one thing I have to say, uh, the, the when you, you're just talking about features you don't know are there until later, and someone else finds it. Um, it's a little known feature. It didn't make anything in the release notes, but it's a, a dehash. And our developers created it, and it was a great idea. And uh, you know, if you're looking on a, on a device for maybe a, a particular image, and you have the hash value, and you're trying to find it with a, a hash set, um, yeah, you're going to find that precise image if it's there. But we all know if I send you something via WhatsApp or I send you something via Messenger or something else, that that image is going to get stripped and it's going to get it's going to be altered. So that hash value is not going to match. But um, one of these cool features that made it in there that we didn't know about was dehash, where we take an image and we create a a, a dehash out of it. Um, I can almost think of it as like making all the images like black and white, and then doing a little comparison. Hey, what what images are black and white kind of match each other. And uh, so, yeah, uh, I, I have a particular image on my computer that has a hash value that you know about. And I, I put it on my phone, send it to you on WhatsApp. 
if I look at the dehash of that image on my computer and look for that same dehash value on your phone, I'm going to find it. Um, just be, even if it's just a thumbnail now and small. Yeah. That was an amazing so, uh, thing that came out. That that sounds brilliant. So a proper degraded fingerprint that that mm -hmm. can match. That that sounds fantastic. I, I'm surprised they didn't yell that from the rooftops. Frankly, yeah, that, that was that was a fun one to find, and uh, I, I have to give props to our tech sales because uh, they did a presentation, and I'm like, what? And uh, <laughs> okay, we need that in training because nobody nobody knew about that. So yeah. some of sometimes those are kind of cool things that we find in the product. Mm. Oh, really really exciting. Help. Cool. Good stuff. Well, James, uh, thank you again for joining us on the Forensic Focus podcast. Yeah, thank absolutely. You. Thanks for inv inviting me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks also to our listeners. You'll be able to find this recording and transcript along with more articles, information, and forums at www.forensicfocus.com. Stay safe and well.